It's on. Maybe I'll put it a little higher. How's that? Okay. So I'm very pleased to be here, and I will uh, get be able to use my new laser pointer, although I have a red one, and I don't know which one I'm going to use here. <laughs> I have to decide. So um, uh, I want to tell you today uh, a story about uh, Maxwell and Einstein, some history, and how we are using that history to do some interesting science. And before I get to Maxwell and Einstein, I wanted to um, sort of jump in to the problem. What, what is the issue and what do we want to do? So I think everyone here in the audience has heard talks about laser cooling and trapping of atoms. And uh, it, it, by and large, it's a, it's a huge success story. Uh, pe people were able to take atoms starting at room temperature and to cool them down, um, to stop them, cool them down to millikelvin, microkelvin, and then use other cooling methods to even to nanokelvin, make degenerate quantum gases. And so uh, you might say, all right, that's, that's it. That's the end of the story, because you can't do any better than going from room temperature to quantum degenerate gases. But uh, if you look at what is required for laser cooling, it is a, a very simple atomic transition, because laser cooling fundamentally uses radiation pressure from photons to change the velocity of the atoms by repeated scattering. When an atom absorbs a photon, it, if it's going opposite to the direction, it slows down, but only by a few centimeters per second, depending on the mass of the atom and the wavelength of the photon. But if it's moving initially at, let's say, 500 meters per second, you need a very large number of photons to bring it to rest. And therein lies the problem that you need a simple transition, of course, accessible with lasers. Those two requirements have, in practice, limited laser cooling to only about 10% of the periodic table. Now, you could say, so what? And some of my laser cooling colleagues get very uh, upset when I bring this up, because it's a little bit of a sore point. Uh, you know, they love the alkali atoms. And one of them actually said, very well-known physicist in this area, said that rubidium is God's gift to physicists. And I, I, I don't disagree with that, but what about other atoms in the periodic table? One of my favorite atoms, for example, is hydrogen. And hydrogen, funny enough, is not amenable to laser cooling. Of course, not because it's, a, its structure is so complicated, but because we don't have a laser at Lyman alpha. So, all right, so we give up on hydrogen. Uh, what else do we give up on? Most of the periodic table. And now, and I, so I hope in this talk to, this, is, this was for me a motivating entry point to say, can we do something? Can we find, perhaps there might be a way to circumvent these requirements, and thereby allowing us to, to control the motion of any element. And what about molecules? You know, that would be nice to be able to, and molecules, you know, if you want to think about a two-level cycling transition, kind of the opposite extreme is a molecule. Even a diatomic molecule is hard to, although there are certain exceptional cases, but in general, the, you, once you have vibrational and rotational excitation, it becomes a mess. So uh, the question is, where do we go? And I, I often tell my students that go outside your field, because if the field is working on laser cooling, you're not going to find the answer there. So I went for inspiration to my friends, the physical chemists, like Dudley, who uh, developed these uh, and worked with these beautiful, um, uh, these beautiful instruments called supersonic beams, or sometimes called molecular beams, which are... Uh, which they found, and, and I guess this goes back to when, the 60s, late, late 60s, 50s even, uh, they found something quite remarkable. Uh, and, and I don't know all the history, and uh, I'm sure Dudley could correct me, but I, uh, th they found that, that when you go from a very high pressure gas, uh, which is called typically a carrier gas, through a small hole into vacuum, uh, there is a collapse of the velocity distribution into some moving frame that is, so you get essentially a very monoenergetic beam that is also quite well collimated, uh, and it has a, uh, it's characterized by some speed ratio, which is the a ratio of the average velocity to the standard deviation, which can in practice be a factor of 100 or higher. What that means, in other words, is that 
you have this gas that is moving at maybe 1,000 meters per second, for example, for helium, but in that frame, its standard deviation can be as small as 10 meters per second. Now, I find that remarkable because that means that you have atoms that have cooled down uh, to tens of millikelvin in the moving frame, and it's for free. No lasers involved. Just, you know, this is just adiabatic expansion of this, of this dense cloud, and it cools. Um, now, what made, has made supersonic beams so important in, uh, for many fields in chemistry and physics is that they really serve as a universal platform for other elements or molecules. And you can, uh, you, typically you work with a, a carrier gas, which is an inert gas like helium or neon, but you can put into it other things. For example, if you have something that's already in gas phase, like molecular oxygen, you can just mix in oxygen with neon, for example, and expand them together. And then you get a, a supersonic beam of O2. Or if it's solid, you can, you can do, for example, laser ablation of the solid right next to the output of the valve, and the atoms will get entrained in the flow, very much like if you took a stick and threw it into a moving stream. It gets carried along. Uh, so I, one could say that supersonic beams are, in fact, a universal source of fast but cold atoms and molecules. Now, what also has happened, there's been a lot of technical development. One of them, interesting from my standpoint, <clears throat> was the development of a very fast valve. This valve was invented by Uzi Evan from Tel Aviv University, who also collaborated with us in some of the early experiments, can, is a mechanical valve that has an opening time of only 10 microseconds. So it lets out a little puff of gas. And I call that a bullet of gas phase atoms or molecules because it, it travels down the tube. It doesn't disperse very much. Uh, and, and now the question is, how can they be slowed? So you, know, you can come up with a variety of ways. One way uh, could be to slam it into a wall. Of course, that's not too interesting. Another way could be to mount this valve or, or this nozzle on a rotating spigot. And this is what Dudley Hirschbach and Igor here are doing, and now other groups. Uh, but our approach was to try and say, find some handle that we can use to, to, uh, to ha exert a force on the desired element or molecule and bring it to rest. So what we want to do is we want to translate the velocity in the lab frame from, say, 500 meters per second to rest, and then we can trap it and do other things with it. The question is, how do we do that? And, and first of all, what, what is the best handle? And, and uh, we claim, we thought of, you know, proposed this back in 2006 or seven, I don't remember exact year, uh, that the, the first point is that if you ask what is the one property in, of atoms in the periodic table that is nearly universal, the answer is paramagnetism. Almost every element is paramagnetic. And if it's not paramagnetic in its ground state, like the alkaline earths or, or the noble gases, you can excite them either with a laser or a discharge and put them into a metastable that is paramagnetic. So I would say virtually everything either is or can be easily made paramagnetic. That means that we have a, an effect, the Zeeman effect, and we can uh, imagine taking atoms, the supersonic beam, and turning on large, large magnetic fields. And the way this slowing would work, it's a time sequence. So uh, this is a, a magnetic decelerator for neutral particles, it's not charged particles. Uh, and uh, how do you make a decelerator? Well, we have a time t equals zero. That's when we open our valve. We let this bullet out of the gate. And it's coming down the tube, but we know how fast it's going. So we energize a coil, a little microcoil, and we can create a field, of, a pulsed field of about five tesla. That's using um, currents up to close to a kiloamp, but only flowing in ordinary copper wire for about 100 microseconds, so it doesn't do any damage. And using solid state switches, we can switch this very fast. So what we do is we let the atoms come in, and we let them ride up this magnet. We basically, they're one, of, one state of the atom it, uh, sees a magnetic hill. And that's called a low field seeking state. When that state comes in, it climbs the magnetic hill, loses kinetic energy. But before it has time to ride off the hill, we switch off the current. And by doing that, we remove a certain amount of kinetic energy. Well, one coil's not enough, so we make an array. And we've built up to 64 coils. But the thing is still about a meter long, so it's you know, quite compact. And we could 
uh, we could stop atoms. And uh, we first reported this in 2008 uh, in my group. And uh, the effort was led by Ed Nerevichus, who's now, uh, who is a postdoc with me. Now he, he's an assistant professor at the Weizmann Institute and has carried on remarkable work, which I will talk about. Uh, and uh, with our first experiment was to stop a beam of metastable neon. And I won't show you the whole picture or the, describe the details of the experiment, but you can read the papers. I'll just point out that this is a picture of the coil gun, a photo of the coil gun looking head on. And, and uh, you can appreciate this picture for two reasons. I tell the students, first of all, it's illuminated from the back, and it proves to the students that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Right? The other thing you may notice and for this audience, is that this has a remarkable resemblance to a Texas Longhorn. <laughs> that was not intentional, but it just turned out that way. And actually, I, I, I was at a party last week, and I, I, I need to incorporate this into my talk, but they actually had a Longhorn there, and I got on it. I have a picture <laughs> on this Longhorn. The, the, the dumbest animal I've ever seen, but otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I got off it the normal way, not through the front. <laughs> uh, it, after we did metastable neon, we, we wanted to see that, that this was quite a general method. In fact, it, because no lasers are involved, this is really just using magnetic moment. It just depends on a time sequence of pulsed magnetic fields. So we put in oxygen. We mix in oxygen with, uh, in this case, krypton, and the same principle worked. We were able to stop a beam of, of uh, molecular oxygen. In parallel to us, uh, the things happen like this. Uh, a group unknown to us and to them were working on essentially the same idea. Uh, Frederick Merck is a chemist in ETH in Zurich, and he had been developing this, and he stopped atomic hydrogen, which is kind of ironic because I'm a physicist and I stopped O2, and he's a chemist and stopped hydrogen, so we made an agreement that we're going to switch now <laughs> from now on. Um, and uh, and so I, and, and I would say that there are many groups now around the world that are building these atomic coil guns. Uh, Merck calls this a multi-stage Zeeman decelerator, but I, I like my name better. Atomic coil gun sounds more dangerous. And uh, there are many groups that are building these because ultimately they're very simple. And if anyone here wants designs, I'll be help, happy to provide them. But I have to say that there's been a big advance recently, and that is something that, that we proposed in 2007, but now Ed and his group have realized in his lab at Weizmann Institute they have built a, a, a adiabatic coil gun, which is really remarkable because what it is, it's a, a magnetic three-dimensional trap. And this trap is turned on in the moving frame at 500 meters per second, and then it tracks the atoms and brings them to rest adiabatically. Now, it does that not by physically moving the coils, which you can imagine would be kind of hard, but by having overlapping coils and by turning them on and off sequentially, you cause the center of the trap to translate in space. And because it's an adiabatic process, it conserves phase space. And the best you can do here, because uh, we, all we want to do is we want to translate the velocity down to zero. However, I should say this is not a cooling method. That means that uh, phase space density, which is the important figure of merit, or entropy equally, is not changed. It could be, you could make it worse. You could, if you let the atoms undergo free expansion, they, their entropy will increase, but we don't want that. We want to make sure that we capture them and ideally bring them to rest. And I would say the adiabatic coil gun does that. It is mode matched to the supersonic source, and it preserves the, the phase space all the way down to zero velocity. So in some sense, now one has to think about doing science with this. But this takes us from, I told you that the temperature is tens of millikelvin to 100 millikelvin or so in some cases as high as a Kelvin. And that's, that's nice, but it's still far from where laser cooling gets you. Right? Laser cooling gets you to perhaps tens of micro Kelvin. So we still need to make a big step. And that step requires actual cooling. So let, let, let's put it, to put it into context, suppose we bring the atoms to rest and we put them in a magnetic trap. The simplest magnetic trap uh, for this, this state of atoms is so-called uh, anti-Helmholtz pair, where you have two coils with current running in opposite directions. You all have heard of Helmholtz pairs. This is what happens when you, the first time you hook up a Helmholtz pair, is you get it wrong, and it becomes an anti-Helmholtz pair. But, but what it, by symmetry, you can see that one creates a magnetic field pointing this way, and the other the opposite direction, so the magnetic field in the center is zero, and it increases in all directions. So a low-field seeker likes to go to the center of that trap. Um, 
And the question is, how can we cool the atoms further? Now, you might say, well, why don't you do evaporative cooling? And I would answer that evaporative cooling uh, works, but it is less general than laser cooling. For example, it works well on rubidium-87, but doesn't work well on rubidium-85. It has to do with the details of collisional physics. Second problem is that typically our densities are not going to be high enough to, in to initiate evaporative cooling. So you have to get it colder first. So you go back to the drawing board. And when I think about cooling in a gen sort of very general sense, textbook sense, you all learn about ad nauseum, uh, these uh, particle in a box, and you have some piston that can move in and out. And you know about the entropy of the gas. And the goal, in our case, is to reduce the entropy, or equivalently, to compress phase space. Well, you know, if I, if I were to just take the piston and compress it, uh, I conserve entropy. So although I may increase the density, I'm also going to increase the kinetic energy of the particles because they'll be seeing a, an advancing wall. So every time they bounce off against it, they will speed up a little bit. You could, uh, you could certainly do things to reduce the to increase the entropy, rather, by using a permeable wall. But we asked this question back in 2004 or 5, uh, could we make a one-way wall? And at the time, when I was thinking about this, I realized that if we could make a one-way wall work, then we could cool particles because suppose that this suppose we have equal equal density on both sides. If we could make a wall that transmits in one direction but not the other, then the atoms would pass through and they wouldn't increase their kinetic energy. So there's no penalty there, but you would increase density. Therefore, you would increase phase space. Or you can another way to say that is you could make a refrigerator cycle where you let all the atoms in, in here, and then you make a one-way wall, and they all accumulate on one side at the same temperature, and then you open the piston up and relax back to the initial condition at lower kinetic energy. So it really is a refrigerator. Uh, so that was interesting. And uh, now, however, I want to make a slight historical digression, because this idea of one-way wall really dates back to 1870. Uh, and it dates back to James Clerk Maxwell, really no, needs no introduction. One thing I found interesting was that Maxwell was actually Einstein's hero, and he kept a picture of him on his mantle and said that he was, the, in his mind, the greatest physicist. And I, I would agree, he's perhaps one of the greatest. And one of the things, of course, he, he did many things in science, but one of the things that I found intriguing uh, was a thought experiment. So of all of Maxwell's achievements, maybe this was the least quantitative, but one that stimulated physicists to talk endlessly for 130 or so years. It was a thought experiment that Maxwell conceived uh, where he imagined that you have this chamber and particles are bouncing around. And he said, suppose you had a creature called the demon. Actually, Maxwell himself didn't call it the demon. That was a name given by, I think, Lord Kelvin, who was Maxwell's friend. Uh, and this demon could see the coming and going of every particle and if a particle was coming from one way, for example, he could open the trap door. But if it was coming from the other, he could close it. And in such a way, could reduce the entropy of, the, of these particles by either there's different ways you could look at it. He, for example, you could, uh, you could cause all the particles to move to one side, raising the pressure on that side. In any case, any way you look at it, this appeared to violate the second law of thermodynamics. So people became very uh, upset about this. But it's interesting to read Maxwell's own words. And I'm not going to say it in his Scottish accent. But uh, if we conceive of a being whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in its course, such a being whose attributes are essentially as finite as our own would be able to do what is impossible to us. The italics are mine. But um, otherwise, these are Maxwell's words. And I find them interesting. Maxwell, apparently, towards the end of his life, was very religious. So the fact that he said this is a finite being, I found interesting. The other point, though, is he said, uh, he could do what is impossible to us. Now, when I say follow every molecule in its course, when you think about that, that implies that you're gathering information. And information was realized that, that it actually carries entropy. And the first person, to my knowledge, who pointed that out, who realized this important uh, insight, uh, was Leo Szilard a Hungarian physicist known for many things, including the nuclear chain reaction. He's one of my heroes, uh, maybe an unsung hero, but a brilliant man who, in 1929, proposed this idea as a resolution of Maxwell's demon. He, in fact, he even con constructed another thought experiment became known as Szilard's engine, and 
Subsequently, people like Landauer and Bennett and Marlon Scully, who I understand is out of town, have analyzed and, and, and dissected. And I think we understand now, uh, at least on a conceptual level, uh, that there is no violation of the second law of thermodynamics because uh, this creature, if he could exist, would collect information, and that information content that would account for the entropy, entropy drop in the gas because there would be an entropy increase in information. However, you know, it's one thing to say it, but then the question is, what is the physical content of this, uh, of this information? And how do one really, can one really make a creature that would do this? And I think for that reason, uh, people did not take Maxwell demons seriously. It, only, it became sort of one of those things that just seemed impossible to do, to actually track, imagine, you know, it'd be one thing to track one, one atom, perhaps, we can do. But you're going to track billions and billions of them, and you're going to react and open gates, and just seem, it seems impossible to imagine. And I think that, that was one reason why Maxwell said this would be impossible to us. But I would say even today, 130 or years later, doing that, if you take it literally, and you're going to track every particle and, and manipulate them that way, I would maintain, at least as far as I'm concerned, is still impossible to us. However, Maxwell was a very smart man, and he had an insight, which is not so well known. But I found it actually a, a, a friend who's a professor of history pointed this out to me a few months ago, and I was actually delighted to, see, to read this, because Maxwell wrote in a letter to Lord Rayleigh, another one of his buddies, uh, he said, I do not see why even intelligence might not be dispensed with and the thing made self-acting, allowing all particles going in one direction while stopping all those going the other way. So Maxwell essentially was saying that the, uh, that the way he saw this could be done, but he didn't know how, in, how would you realize it in practice. But at least conceptually, he said, why would, you don't really need an intelligent creature. You just need an automatic one-way wall. That's what he was proposing, essentially, was a one-way wall. And I think this point maybe was forgotten or just somehow vanished into history. And, and, and what remained was the impossibility of actually making this demon, you know, who would open and close trap doors. So now I come back to 2005, where not really not knowing the history of Maxwell's demon, I mean, we didn't approach it from that direction, just completely independently was thinking about how to cool particles and said, whoa, if we could make a one-way wall, that would be interesting. And, and so we actually you know, put in some uh, specific schemes using atoms and transitions and lasers, and we came up with some proposals how you could, you could do this in practice. And we came up with two, two conceptual papers, which we published. And in parallel to us, uh, Gonzalo Muga, who's in Bilbao, and his postdoc, Andreas Ruschop, independently <clears throat> thought of a what they called an atom diode. Uh, we were concerned about cooling. They were not con so concerned about cooling, but just how to regulate atoms kind of in a, like an analog of a circuit, on a, an electrical circuit. Now, uh, from the concept, <clears throat> because I run an experimental group, uh, we had to build the experiment. But let, before I do the, explain that, let me just say that, let me give you a feeling for how this one-way wall works. Well, if you want to, uh, somehow you have to break the symmetry. So you go, going this way is not the same as going that way. You could, uh, so it's clear that it, just having a conservative potential is not good enough because there's nothing that breaks the symmetry. So you need some irreversible step. Well, we have an irreversible step for atoms, and that's called spontaneous emission. But we don't want the atom to return to its original state because that's not going to allow us to, dis to make this wall operate in this fashion. Instead, we want to start out in this initial state, which is red, and end up in a different state, which is called in blue. And I'm assuming both states are, are stable or metastable, so they don't decay. But we can couple them irreversibly, one to the other, by means of a laser that, that drives a transition from the, excited st from the initial state to an excited state, which spontaneously decays to the final state. And maybe some of the time it decays to the initial state. Eventually, we can, we can do what's called optical pumping, where we would, by, by just shining a few photons, we can get it to move completely over to this state. And so if we can optically pump an atom, which I would say almost every atom that I know is amenable to optical pumping, then we could do that. And now the idea is to make a potential 
that looks different to this state versus that state. And there's a variety of ways you can do that, and I won't go into all of them. I'll just say, for example, you can make one state magnetic and the other not magnetic, for example. So one would be affected by magnetic fields and the other not. Um, but uh, I, th I think that that's the general feel, and you can read the papers to find out more details. But let me, let me explain how, if you could make this one-way wall, how you would actually use it to cool atoms. And I want to discuss that in the context of the magnetic trap. Remember, that was the final step at the end of the coil gun. We can confine atoms in this V-shaped potential, the simplest potential. We could make a harmonic potential as well. So how can we cool them? with this one-way wall. Well, remember, what we're going to do is this, this potential is uh, con a combination of a conservative potential, but it's also got a laser beam in it that will switch the atom from red to blue irreversibly. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with this one-way wall uh, far away, and these hot atoms are bouncing around, but we're going to slowly, slowly move this inwards, and we're going to catch the atoms that are hottest. Those atoms have the, the largest turning radius. They have a classical turning radius where they've converted all their kinetic energy into potential. So at that point, they cross over this one-way wall and are hit by the laser and converted to a blue atom, and they're stuck. They can't come back. But when we convert them, we've taken out their kinetic energy. In other words, we've let the trap do the work on the particles. And the photon momentum is not important here because we're not using the momentum of the photon to stop the atom. We're letting the trap do the work. We're just using the photon to change the atom, to flip it from red to blue. And now we start moving this wall in, and as we collect atoms, they will be, they'll be cold because we've taken out their kinetic energy, and we move it in all the way till we have a, a collection of cold blue atoms. Now, you might wonder, well, this is a toy model. It's in one dimension. How does this work in reality? So that's why we had to build an experiment. And I won't go through the details of the experiment, but I'll show you the end result. And the end result is that this works. Uh, we, we did this actually on rubidium because we had uh, laser-cooled rubidium, so we could put them in a magnetic trap and to demonstrate that this kind of cooling works. We call it single photon cooling as opposed to laser cooling because because it brings an atom to rest or near rest by scattering only one photon per atom on average, maybe two. You know, it's, it's a few photons. Uh, and in our first experiment, which came out back to back with the coil gun in the, in the same issue, uh, papers right next to each other, uh, we reported a factor of 23 times increase in phase space density. Since then, we improved that number to 350 times. This is a big effect. We were able to cool substantially. Uh, in, in, in a three-dimensional sense. We really compressed phase space. Okay, so now I claim that this is a generic cooling method because all it requires is having three or more internal levels. It doesn't require uh, a cycling transition. And these levels can be anything. They can be magnetic levels in an atom. They could be hyperfine, uh, electronic, or in a molecule, rotational, vibrational. And in fact, we proposed in this conceptual paper how you could use this for cooling of molecules. Now, the only, and I better use this laser pointer or my folks will get upset, right? Uh, the only case that is not possible, ironically, is a two-level atom. Because a two-level atom uh, doesn't allow you to change the state irreversibly. It always comes back to the same state. So you can't make a one-way wall work. Um, there are not too many two-level atoms in nature, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, if you in include magnetic levels, I don't know if there is one. Maybe a terbium, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe, But it's very rare. Alkali atoms, for example, have hyperfine structure. So they have enough internal levels for, th for this to work. So um, I claim that, uh, that this single photon cooling is, realizes Maxwell's demon exactly in the sense that he proposed. Uh, it uses the photon, uh, photon entropy and not the photon momentum. In fact, you can understand, in this case, where the information is going. You can think about our, our laser beam that, that makes this transition is a source of zero entropy photons, because all the photons are very ordered. But when an atom crosses this one-way wall, it absorbs a photon and scatters it into, into, into free space, into all directions. You can calculate the entropy increase of that photon. And we did that in this little uh, conceptual paper here, and we found 
that that entropy increase exactly compensates the entropy decrease of our gas. So now we have not only something that works, but we understand the physical mechanism of where the entropy is going and where, where is, the, is the information. It is carried away by that photon. And in a very real sense, you could have a detector. You don't have to actually detect it, but you could imagine a detector that would sit there, and when an atom crosses the one-way wall, you'd get a click. So you would say, aha, an atom just went through. So you really do learn something in principle. Um, but you don't have to measure it. Now, so I, I would claim, you know, when you put these things together, the, the control of atomic velocities, starting from supersonic beams and, and magnetic control, combined with this concept of single photon cooling, uh, provides a, a general, a comprehensive approach that will work on almost any atom. And that's summarized in this review article that I wrote in a Scientific American in 2011. Uh, which, that's the title, that's the title that the editors at Scientific American made up. The rest of the article I wrote, and I didn't change anything, but they did change the title. Uh, it's, it's not online, but if you, if you write to me, I'll be happy to send you a copy. Uh, so what, what are we going to do with this? You know, so you might say, all right, you can cool any atom, which one do you want to do? <laughs> And everyone could have their own answer. Uh, my answer, because I've been interested in this for a long time, is trapping and cooling of hydrogen isotopes. Because I've been motivated by the beautiful work of Kleppner and Greytack. I wanted to see if we can you know, really control the motion of hydrogenic atoms. And so we are pursuing that in my lab right now. And uh, we just got funded by NSF to actually to do this. They actually are giving us money to do this. <clears throat> but um, to, to, to think about, uh, you know, other atoms, well, everyone might say we have a favorite atom that we'd like to trap and cool. Although uh, you, you might, you know, be, play devil's advocate, say, well, why would you want to have laser-cooled nickel or laser-cooled molybdenum or, you know, some other odd atom? And I, I don't have a good answer to that. In fact, uh, my answer is different, and I'll come back to a second. But let me say that that beyond physics, I think that uh, this already this kind of magnetic control of supersonic beams is already leading to interesting uh, science, such as chemistry. And uh, for example, uh, the ability to trap and cool molecules and, and study uh, quantum chemistry, study chemical reactions where the, the pathways are determined by quantum mechanics. And Ed and his group had just have, a, I, in my view, a spectacular result that appeared in Science uh, just last week. And it, it, they, they took a beam of... Um, of, I believe, H2, H, no, I think it was H2, yeah, H2, and, and they took another supersonic beam of metastable neon, I think, helium, metastable helium, and they saw, um, and, and they imposed a very large magnetic field, uh, that, that uh, gradient that caused a deflection of the metastable beam, because that is magnetic, the, the hydrogen is, H2 is non-magnetic, and they merged the beams together. So now they were co-propagating, and by timing, by just choosing the relative timing, they could make them collide at energies down to, I think, around 10 millikelvin. And so they, they saw the reaction rate, in this case, penning ionization, as a function of energy, and they saw very beautiful oscillations, which they attribute to, to quantum mechanics. And so this was really, I think, just the start of these kind of experiments, and Ed and his group are going to pursue some of the base, so simplest canonical reactions, such as H2 plus F, which they can do. And I think this is going to open up in some interesting directions in quantum chemistry. Uh, but I would say that all of this, essentially, is uh, science with matter in gas phase. And that's where we came from, really, to say, uh, can we trap and cool atoms in a general way? But what if my answer is that maybe the ultimate goal is not trapping and cooling? of atoms to the absolute zero. Maybe that's not the most interesting goal. It certainly, you know, that was, that's been the theme of laser cooling and trapping. But there might be other things you could do. And that's what I want to talk about the rest of the time that I have. Um, if you think about it, that we, you know, in a very block diagram way, we start from a solid, we heat it up, vaporize it, and go to gas phase. And we can imagine then going back to a solid. That's not too interesting. <laughs> But suppose we can find ways of controlling the motion of the atoms in between, on the fly. So we could rearrange them in some interesting manner and then deposit them. What could we do? 
Well, one answer that I have is we could separate isotopes. And we proposed this in 2009 and have been working on it for the last few years, what we call magnetically activated and guided isotope separation. So the basic concept, I'm not going to go into the details, but the basic concept is Maxwell's demon, again. The demon in this case is a sorting demon. This is like the I, 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 analogy to the historic pointsmen of the railroad tracks who would switch the tracks. You have a stream of atoms, and you have a d different one isotope that you want to separate out. We can tag that isotope using lasers and put it into a magnetic state that, is, that it responds differently than the others. And we can use magnetic fields to then deflect it away. And because we work on the magnetic moment, not on the mass charge to mass or something like that, we can actually be very efficient. In fact, uh, I believe that this will replace the calutron. And the calutron is, up till now, invented in 1930 by Lawrence, uh, has, is the general purpose separator. It's an electromagnetic separation that relies on ionization followed by separation by charge to mass ratio, requiring a very large chamber. So, um, in fact, uh, if you think about, well, what, what would isotopes be interesting for? One answer is uh, the most fundamental research. May, may help us answer really important questions in physics. For example, uh, calcium-48, neodymium-150 are prime candidates for searching for an effect called neutrinoless double beta decay. Uh, this is an effect that, uh, if seen, would prove that the neutrino is its own antiparticle, called the Majorana particle, and also prove, if you could then measure the decay rate, what is the rest mass of the neutrino. So, you know, tremendously important physics here, if you can isolate these isotopes. But this one has a natural abundance of 0.2%. And this has a natural abundance of 5%. Well, I went in my seminar yesterday, but most of you weren't there. Uh, I, I talked in detail how we're going to do this. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that in addition to basic science, there are also real-life applications that actually are important for everyone's health. For example, calcium-48 is a stable isotope. is already used as a tracer in osteoporosis and bone development. Nickel-64. It's a 1% natural abundance, but you can convert it if you can enrich it as a stable isotope to 99%. Put it in a cyclotron, a medical cyclotron, and convert it to copper 64, which is a very promising radioisotope for uh, PET scans and cancer therapy. Uh, and in fact, this seems so, so, so immediate that I've done something that I've never done in my career. I've actually started a company to do this. And this company will be run by several of my former PhDs who are also found, co founders. Atomotech, which now has an investor group and will produce these medical isotopes uh, such as calcium-48 and nickel-64, ytterbium-176, and on and on. And uh, so that's, that's a new experience in the past year. Uh, but in fact, in parallel, we had, you know, going from the concept to actually doing it, even though uh, I, I knew this in principle could work, one really has to show this in the laboratory. And we proposed the idea in uh, the latest realization in 2012. But um, very recently, last few weeks, the experiment's working. And we demonstrate uh, that we can take lithium and we can deplete the lithium-6 content almost entirely. Uh, in fact, within our signal-to-noise, we are completely depleting it to uh, 100 times greater than 100 times. Uh, I believe that we ha we'll see how much greater. But already, we can deplete it so that natural lithium, we can take natural lithium and produce highly depleted lithium with 99.95% purity, which is what is needed for cooling water in re every reactor in the world. And they need that because they can't have lithium-6. Lithium-6 absorbs neutrons, which then convert it to tritium. And that's a real problem. So one needs highly depleted lithium. Uh, so I think it's encouraging that, that now this process works. Uh, but more importantly, it shows that it's scalable. And in terms of how many photons per, you use per atom, it, it is the single photon approach in the sense that you just need a few photons per atom, which means that this is scalable laser-wise. You can do this with low power lasers. For example, we think that with one watt of 671 light from a diode laser at, uh, uh, for lithium, we can separate several kilograms may produce several kilograms of this highly depleted lithium, because we're only using a few photons per atom. So that's one direction. I think this is exciting, because isotopes are so widely used and needed, and especially because the calutron 
running right now, the remaining, the one remaining Calitron is in Russia, and I understand it's going to shut down probably in a few years because it's very old technology. So that's one, you know, here's an example of an interesting way to rearrange atoms on the fly. But that's not it. That's not all of it. In fact, um, up till now, atomic physics and cold atoms has not had an impact on materials, except for, uh, I would say the exception, and it's, it's only an analogy. So there's a lot of beautiful work on making quantum simulation of condensed matter models, and, 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 I, and that work is continuing. But perhaps we could actually use atoms to control the nanoscale in a new way. And what, I, what we're working on, and I think we're hopefully a few months away from demonstrating, is that we can use the same magnetic forces that we use to stop atoms, we can use to focus them and focus them down to the diffraction limit, which for the case of a 500 meter per second a t a supersonic beam will be a few angstroms. In principle, this could be really on the atomic scale. And so what, what are the virtues? Why, why is this interesting? And you can even, you can even tr draw analogies with, with uh, electron beam, e-beam lithography and the electron microscope, because after all, you know, you have a source. In the electron, case of electron mi a microscope, you take a, a field emitter and it emits electrons. Well, we have a supersonic beam. Uh, our supersonic beam is already highly monochromatic. Uh, but in fact, we can do much better. And I don't have time to talk about this. Maybe next time I come here, I can tell you about a way that we have to make a one-way wall, not in real space, but in velocity space. And we believe that we could actually compress uh, by, by, by quite a bit. We can collapse the beam in velocity space on the fly and compress it in three dimensions in velocity space. So we can brighten it. That's something you cannot do, to my knowledge, with electrons. So with electrons, what you have to do is you have to filter. And when you filter, you throw away a lot of flux. So I would say, you know, when you want to think about optics, here's the source. Then the next big question is, what are your optics? Well, in our case, optics means primarily lenses. And uh, our, we can use uh, magnetic lenses. A magnetic lens is a configuration that produces a linear gradient transverse to the beam. So while in the, in the coil gun approach, we, we wanted to have primarily, uh, we worked on the longitudinal component of velocity. For, if you want to make a good lens, you actually want to have no potential axially, but you want to have a very strong gradient radially. And we can do that several ways. One is we have found a geometry that produces a perfectly linear gradient. One nice thing that we can do that you can't do with electrons is we can actually wait till, the, till, till our bunch of atoms is inside the, the, the coil and then pulse it on. And what that achieves is it avoids any fringing fields. So you really also can't do that with electrons because they're traveling too fast. But in our case, we, that's actually practical, and we will do that because that minimizes aberrations. And so achieving diffraction limit in optics is all about dealing with aberrations because finally, I mean, the fundamental limit is diffraction limit. But we believe that we have this under control, and uh, what you could do with this, <laughs> for example, is you could uh, take a transmission mask and image that down. It might build a microscope, essentially, that would image it down 30x or 50x and take some, some pattern of holes and shrink it down where it would, you would deposit on a substrate. Uh, some of the things that are exciting to think about are what I call A-beam lithography as opposed to E-beam. Uh, in this case, the, the, um, the, uh, we, we would use metastable atoms, like metastable helium, which sits about 20 electron volts above the ground state. When it hits a surface, it deactivates, and, and, and that, those 20 EV, uh, first of all, you get an electron comes off from penny ionization, but um, more importantly, uh, from the standpoint of lithography, you can have a resist. And in fact, George Whitesides from Harvard has already shown, and together with Mara Prentice, that you can make a monolayer, uh, self-assembled monolayer that has a, you know, about one nanometer thickness, and you can damage that resist with metastables. So now if you can focus a pattern, you could etch away and have, have in principle, down to one nanometer, I believe, resolution. So that would be interesting. Uh, and, and what could you do with that? Well, for example, if we could, suppose we could make reproducible quantum dot arrays, which is something currently material science can't do very well. Even the state of the art of molecular beam epitaxy has, is very good at going controlled layers, but not good at controlling transverse structures. So they rely on something that's called self-assembly. 
For example, indium arsenide quantum dots rely on self-assembly, and the problem with that is that they uh, basically nucleate on random sites, and, and you, you get huge fluctuations in, in site in site to site, and also distance between quantum dots, and also their size variation can be a factor of 10. I mean, my condensed matter colleagues tell me that a quantum dot is the analog of our atom. And I have to remind them that, yes, but all atoms are the same. And, but what if we could make quantum dots that are, that are the same? Then this would, this would really be enormously powerful, because you can imagine making arrays for, for photonics and so on and so forth. Um, I think for, for fabricating, for making nano antennas for photonics and plasmonics would be interesting. Uh, and, and we're developing a concept of, of uh, what I call an atom microscope. This would be a chemically sensitive microscope where uh, people have already shown, chemists have already shown that metastable atoms, when they eject an electron, that electron can be energy analyzed and it, and it shows what was on the surface. Actually, by looking at the spectrum, you can tell what was, what was there. And if we can focus down to the nanoscale, we would have a, a chemically sensitive microscope, which to my knowledge does not exist. So, um, all right, so that brings me near the end of my talk. I have about five minutes. And some of you may be thinking, all right, I told you about Maxwell. What about Einstein? <laughs> why, why am I giving this such short shrift? Well, here's Albert Einstein. Needs no introduction. Uh, I have to say, although, although, um, uh, Maxwell was Einstein's hero. Uh, the reverse was not true. <laughs> Hopefully you will understand why. Uh, but it doesn't reflect badly on Maxwell. Uh, so uh, Einstein did many things, and, I, and I'm not going to go through them. But one of the things, one of his you know, important contributions was to Brownian motion. His theory of Brownian motion from 1905, describing diffusion, uh, Einstein said that uh, on, on long time scales, Brownian motion uh, means erratic motion, where velocity is not a well-defined quantity. Because how do you define velocity? There, it's, it's constantly changing its magnitude and direction. So you can't even ask the question, what is the kinetic energy of a Brownian particle? Because if it doesn't have a well-defined velocity, there's no meaning to that. However, Einstein said, well, a particle has mass, which has inertia. So there must be a time scale over which it does have a well-defined velocity. And he called that the instantaneous velocity. And, and he said, um, so if you think about here's some erratic trajectory, it's like saying there is a tangent. And if you could look in and measure that tangent, then you'd say, uh huh, there, there is a velocity. Uh, and in fact, you could say that in reality, you could call this Maxwell's demon, although I, I Unfortunately, I can't ask Einstein if he was aware or if he thought about Maxwell's demon, but it really is. Uh, the, it, this is a different kind of demon. This is a demon that is not trying to see billions of particles. It just wants to see one, but it wants to see it really fast. So I would call that a speed demon. And, can, and, and Einstein actually talked about this in, in a, le, a lesser known paper in 1907. He talked about this, uh, this uh, demon, in, in a sense. He didn't call it that, but I think you can interpret that way, um, about measuring the instantaneous velocity. He said, we must conclude that the velocity and direction of a motion of particle will already very greatly altered in extraordinarily short time theta and indeed a totally irregular manner. It is therefore impossible uh, to ascertain the mean velocity by observation. So that was in 1907. And since I'm running out of time, I will just jump to the uh, today that we've measured this. And I won't tell you how, but if you want to read the paper, you're welcome to. Um, and we measured this for a Brownian particle in air. By, and the, the, I would say the technology that enabled this, that uh, reason it hadn't been done before, is we developed a new kind of, a, a better way to measure beam pointing fluctuations. We could measure beam pointing fluctuations of a laser on a time scale that was about a thousand times faster than anything commercially available. And by incorporating that with optical tweezers, we were able to track the instantaneous velocity of a particle in air. And now, uh, so, so some people said we proved Einstein wrong. I wouldn't say we proved him wrong. We proved him right, actually, because we, we were able to actually measure the velocity. And then we could ask a simple question, uh, what is the average kinetic energy of a Brownian particle? And we found it's just 1 half kT. So it's just the equipartition theorem of statistical mechanics. But that, this had not been measured. <clears throat> so it wasn't too surprising. But nevertheless, 
uh, we have excellent agreement with a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution with no adjustable parameters, so we now can see directly the, this instantaneous velocity. Um, but, but some people said, oh, you know, that's nice, but, uh, but Einstein was referring to water, and you did it in air, so, all right. So now we did it in water. <laughs> but we haven't published it yet. But we, we see in water, uh, much harder. Now, now we actually have to go to, uh, we, we had to develop the detector that can resolve down to motion of a, of a few femtometers per root hertz. So we have by far, I think, the most sensitive, position-sensitive detection uh, of motion and time scales of tens of nanoseconds. But we can now resolve the instantaneous velocity. And again, we agree with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution within our error bar. But uh, for me, this is interesting because it's an entry point to start studying non-equilibrium physics. Once you understand this point, once you can really uh, understand equilibrium, uh, th there really shouldn't be surprises. I mean, if there were surprises, I'd be very concerned. But now we can drive the bead in a way that we can see non-equilibrium and, and ask, I think, pretty fundamental questions about the onset of irreversibility in a fluid. Uh, we, can, we can give the bead a big kick that would be way out of equilibrium and see what happens to that and how is entropy produced. Uh, and, and, and really, in some sense, you could view this as a microscope in space and in time looking at something like water. And now we can compare with other fluids like acetone, which we're doing right now. So uh, I will end here. Uh, I just want to end with a quote from Einstein because uh, to me this is always the uh, in interesting question when you're doing theory and experiment is have you made it as simple as you can? Uh, and so Einstein said everything should be made sim as simple as possible but not simpler. And I love that quote. So uh, I just end here, and I'd like to thank and acknowledge all the current members of my group, uh, postdocs and students and undergraduate, graduate and undergraduate students, and thank you for your attention. We're so far from the uncertainty limit that uh, if I if I if I get to the uncertainty if I we're, we're not we're you know our initial phase space is in other words our phase space density is initially is ten to the minus six so so when you get to phase space density of one then I start worrying I think we can compress it to about ten to the minus three <clears throat> or ten to the minus four so, you know, on that neighborhood maybe by three orders of magnitude so uh, we're still far from where you have to worry about any coupling between uh, of uncertainty. Why? I'm no, I'm 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 compressing delta I'm compressing delta v, but I'm not cha I'm not affecting position. I'm not I'm not changing the density. I'm just compressing in velocity space. And I haven't really told you how, so you'll have to wait until I we're we're going to have a preprint out for, in the next few weeks, hopefully, about doing that. Uh, I, I'm not sure. But I, I, what I would, my, my, my first response to that would be that, that, that the kinetic energy of the atoms landing on the surface is irrelevant because it's going to be governed by the dynamics on the, the energetics of the surface. So I, I would take a different approach. I would say we're going to, if we, if we deposit atoms, we would deposit atoms that have such low mobility that they should stick, like chromium, on, and, and then we could use that as a template for self-assembly, for example. But, uh, but if we deposit something that has high mobility, even if we put it in the right place, it's not going to stay there. So I think that we, we have to, this is where it's going to be interesting and fun to work closely with material scientists to do this. And I, I actually have a collaboration now with a uh, professor of electrical engineering who's an expert on MBE growth. And so we hope to work together on this.
let me ask you another, let me, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll answer a question with a question. If you're in an elevator and the elevator goes down, do, do, do you stay stationary and, and no, no, if, if the elevator's going down slowly enough, you will track with it. In fact, if you all go into free fall, which is not a good idea, but you will still stay together. Only if the elevator is, is, move, is accelerating faster will it drop from under your feet. In the same sense here, it, we have to move this barrier adiabatically so that we don't lose the, we don't excite those atoms. Another way to say it quantum mechanically is that, even though you want, could think about it classically, but if the atoms are in certain energy levels, you don't want to drive transitions between them to excite them up to higher levels. But if you move adiabatically, you, you will preserve that. I mean, I can, I can obviously, I, if I have a sample of trapped atoms in, in, in the ground state, a tweezer, I can move that tweezer around, and, at the, and we've done this, and we transport a Bose condensate over several meters, and we don't excite them. You just have to move it slowly enough. And, and slowly enough, in, in our case, meant uh, the other uh, order of 100 milliseconds. We, we actually did experiments where we moved it much faster, and we didn't get we didn't get the effect we wanted. No. Um, uh, no. Uh, the, well, the the time scale for instantaneous velocity actually is not picoseconds. It's not given by the time. In other words, the way to think about this ballistic motion is not that it's a free particle during that time. Because in fact, in, in, even in air, the time between collisions is much faster than we could hopefully, you know, possibly measure. But really, it's due to the inertia of the particle. And it's related to the viscosity of the medium as well. So in fact, for, for water, the time scale is, is, turns out to be about one microsecond. So you have, to turn, you have to look on a time scale fast compared to a microsecond. And but, but there are interesting effects that come about at much shorter time scales. For example, we think that we, if we go down to nanoseconds, we could start to see compressibility effects in the fluid. And we could see, uh, you know, one thing you don't have to worry about for a be little bead in air is that, is that it, in, the, in air, the mass that it's displacing is negligible. But in the fluid, it's not. It's actually pushing along, displacing a significant mass. And that's called added mass. And Eventually, if you go to a short enough time scale, you, we should start to see the bare mass of the, of the bead itself. And actually, we think that we might be able to do this. We're, we're have, we have some ways to get down to the one nanosecond time scale where we could start to see these effects. It depends also on the size. Sorry, I was not here. Oh, yeah. What happened was the following. I have some laser tape. I got into five pieces of security. And he said, I have to set up the security. And I said, what are you guys here for? Actually, that makes me feel better. You know why? Because they took me out to lunch, and it was a two and a half hour lunch. And so I actually missed. Missed the appointment with you. Okay. So, so, so it was mutual. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so uh, very nice. Some other time, yeah. I, I probably not. Yeah, yeah. Probably. But anyway, if, you know, typical A&M, the security officer, just says, if you don't do it, I'll shut you down. And I said, why are you not doing the taping and all that? You know, he said, we are just the ones who are Yeah. Anyway, okay. very nice. So, so I actually have one question. When you have separated the laser in the one-way wall and you uh, bring it in a metastable state, then that needs to be magnetic, so you do some magnetic separation. Is there some other way? Other way to do what? To do what? To, oh. to, to do this. Uh, to do separate. Could be optical. Could, could, could do it optically. Have but, you done it optically? No, but my former student at Dan said at the University of Oregon, I didn't have time to go to that, but he did a beautiful experiment where he shows all, all options how, how the formula was. He, he published it just as a better uh, after, after we 
you can do it all with other guys. Daniel Steck. Yeah, okay. Oh. Yeah. No, he's not in the team. Dan's on a different set. Yeah. 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 Daniel Steck yeah. yeah. graduated from Texas. Oh, okay. He's now yeah. 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 Hey, nice to see you, dude. Yeah. 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 Say hi to me. I will. I will. He yeah. didn't come today. He called. He called. He called. Yeah, we were in Scotland. That's good. Where <laughs> were you from? Back down. Thank you. 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 Thank basically growing into material and such. That's why I'm yeah. curious about this. So one of the things, I'm not talking about necessarily creating with um, lateral structure, like lithography. I mean, that's one cool thing, but I'm thinking yet about growing with oh, thin okay. layers thin layer. of materials where you can order them. You know, like essentially there is a technique you're probably familiar with besides the CMD, the atomic layer derivative. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, where, I mean, so you still get some sort of uh, higher energetic, you know, yeah. atoms with uh, this higher energy. Right. And that can lead to various effects that, you know, may have, if they are reacting with them, can initiate the reaction or whatever. Uh, or even arrangement, the way, specifically the way they arrange. Do you have any, do you have any paper that summarizes that? No, I don't. Actually, I'm just trying to uh, look at the ALD. I mean, I haven't done that. Yeah, yeah. But that's where I'm thinking, you know, it might be an idea of, you know, if we can control with the temperature that is, and you're right about skipping transition, that can also be beneficial. So that if you can, I mean, if you have essentially what line, you have like an additional handle on how they land, that can. But I'm, but I'm surprised by that because the, the energy, kinetic energy is really electric. Like Surface energies are much similar. So why would that even play a role? Well, if you can, I mean, uh, if you pull down the substrate, then that's one thing. But you still have the momentum of the atoms that are coming, you know, the regular dissolution right, right. And that, that momentum, well, it reduces the how they stick, and also that affects uh, how. I my at least my understanding, maybe I'm wrong here. My understanding that that affects how they. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Take it with a grain of salt, but that's something that you know I thought might be an interesting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And just a quick question. I assume that this is also one of the classes I teach here, or I assume it's going to be in a lot of public lectures. So yeah. How have you ever had problems with talking about the Why? Well, I mean. Well, uh, in, uh, all, in all the religions, I know. Um, I, I wonder about that, especially, uh, I, I haven't had that. This particular negative connotation. Yeah, yeah. So you've never had any? No, I haven't. Not, not yet. Just curious. But, but of course, when we do things like high school simulations, someone might say that. Let me just say that uh, I 
Demonstration purposes is high, but I don't think it's just there. So we're hoping to do that. Because, because one, one thing is the efficiency of capturing the sound is not great. In one dimension, you capture it, but in three dimensions, there's trajectory that you don't capture. So even though, but we did improve the free space based on it, but we only got a few pieces of that. So we would like to improve the free space. Right, right. Oh, I see. You really want to say that it's something that's like the one involved. Yeah. I've been here for three months. You can talk to me. Not much time. Uh, if you talk to me, just keep speaking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> My wife.